let's uh, <clears throat> get our Bibles and continue our study on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We are talking about waiting for the second coming of the Lord. <clears throat> and uh, I think the times are, especially we are doing, doing uh, this study also on Sunday mornings. If you are watching the news, <clears throat> Netanyahu, I, I don't know what, if there's a trick under his sleeves or... or uh, it, it's not always as it seems, but if you will remember before, <clears throat> he was talking about two-state solution in the Middle East, but he will not compromise any of the land that uh, Israel has. But now, I think with the current administration, there's a new push taking place. And so there's a headline uh, today wherein Netanyahu seems to just agree on a two-state solution. So, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, I, I believe that uh, as the spirit of the Antichrist continues to prevail, what we are seeing is Israel is, is out of options. It's, it's, it's being squeezed as we see right now. So, keep watching the nation. <clears throat> uh, peace will not, will not be brokered by these people. As I told you last Sunday, the only person who will be able to broker this peace will be the Antichrist. And so it's, it's going to be a false peace, and that false peace will be the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Now, we are not in the Great Tribulation yet, I'm, I'm sure of it, but uh, I think we're pretty close. And so uh, last week we talked about uh, <clears throat> waiting for the second coming of the Lord, <clears throat> and we basically touched on the life of sanctification. And we ended saying, it is the will of God. When you say sanctification, that means we live a life set apart. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, <clears throat> but we have to have the uh, assurance because we know you and I should be able to say, my life is set apart for God. Now, we know from that word sanctification in the temple if the basins are set apart for God, they are not to be used for something else. You know, Daniel, in the book that we were studying, Nebuchadnezzar took the utensils of a temple and brought them to, uh, to Babylon. And then Belshazzar decided <clears throat> that uh, he's going he's gonna to use it. So he used it, and that is when he was judged. You have been measured and have been found wanting. That same night <clears throat> that he used the temple utensils, Cyrus marched almost unopposed in the, in the, in the city of Babylon and took the city. You, you see, the Lord is not like us. He doesn't panic. And he doesn't have to do something right away. But his word is true. And so those utensils are sanctified. And the moment they were used... For something else, judgment fell right away. Now, if you're saying we are living a sanctified life, that means your life, my life, it's only for the use of God. If, if it's used for something else, well, you cannot destroy the, the vessel of the Lord, and then God will take you faultless for it. Now, remember, it's the same God. And so we're going to uh, apply the teaching on sanctification for the coming of the Lord tonight. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. <clears throat> for it is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body and in holiness and honor, <clears throat> not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses, as we also previously told you and warned you. Now, we know from the writings of Paul that when he talks about the family, husband and wife, uh, parents and children, <clears throat> and then the subjects of immorality, we know that ultimately what, uh, what Paul has in mind is the body of Christ. So, for example, when he says, wives submit to your husbands, <clears throat> today, 
feminists and those influenced by the feminists, we immediately say, well, it's both ways. Well, in your Bible, not in mine. Okay? Because remember, Paul said this, um, I am talking about the church and the Lord Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is the bride of Christ? That's right. So it's the picture of a human bride also, right? Is that correct? This is not a trick question. Don't think too far, okay? Right? Now, who is the head of the church? Jesus Christ. Who is the head of the house? The Father, right? Now, let me ask you this, because Paul said this, that he, I'm not really talking just about the earthly relationship. I'm talking about uh, Jesus and the church, right? Now, we are the bride of Christ, right? Any of you here dare to say to Jesus, we are co-heads? <laughs> Anybody here? So why is it that in earthly relationship we say women are co-heads in the family? It's the same relationship. And so when a woman says, well, you know, fellow submission, let me ask you this. Can you talk to Jesus right now and say, Jesus, submit to me? Can you say that? That is precisely what Paul is talking about. He said, I'm not just talking about earthly relationship. I'm talking about the relationship of Jesus and the church. That is the exact picture. I don't know why our, our puny little heads cannot get that. We keep, we keep trying to uh, modify and alter the word of the Lord when it is as simple as it gets. This is the picture. So when, when uh, Paul, here in sanctification, begin to talk, about immorality and all of this. He's not just talking about earthly relationships. He's talking about Jesus and the church. And, and that makes it serious because <clears throat> the way we deal with our earthly relationships as defined in the scriptures is a manifestation on how we define our relationship with Jesus Christ. So, for example, if the church begins to say, well, you know, the husband and the wife are co-heads. What you're saying is the church and Jesus are co-heads of the same body. Now, will that be biblical? That's not a trick question, guys. Answer everybody, yes or no. Will that be biblical? Why are you so quiet, guys? It's a very simple analogy and a very simple uh, uh, comparison that Paul is making. But I think the, uh, the liberal thoughts and the feminist movement has so influenced even the church that we forget this basic thing, okay? Now, verses 3 to 6 form a single sentence, incidentally, in the Greek sentence. It's closely knitted together that they have to be uh, understood and interpreted as one. <clears throat> By the way, my previous point, you know it's true. None of you here will say to Jesus, we are co-heads. No, not, none of us will do that. And yet we dare, in human relationship, says that the wife is a co-head with the husband. What Bible are you reading? You know, uh, that is just not there. Uh, you have been influenced by, by liberal feminist philosophy, but that is not the Bible. Again, I will not dare tell Jesus, submit to me. So why will a wife tell the husband, submit to me? That's the same relationship that uh, Paul is comparing. Is that, is that clear or is it not? Maybe I should say, sila. Sila na mag-isip. But that is, you know, when I look at the scriptures like this, the older I get in my meditation, the the simpler things get. And I, I am beginning to see more and more that what troubles us and what confuses us is actually we allow human philosophies and human thoughts to invade our interpretation of the Scriptures when the Bible says it is of no private interpretation. Okay? So that's a simple thought out there. So keep it in mind as you interpret the Scriptures. First, in verse 3, how do we apply it to say, well, my life is sanctified? So my question to you is, 
Are your lives so sanctified? Why are your answers so hesitant? <clears throat> Let me ask that again. Are your lives sanctified? Yes. Not, not so convincing, okay? So let's do it one more, once more. Uh, <clears throat> are your lives sanctified? Yes. Okay, okay. I believe you. Yeah. So first of all, Paul said, if your life is sanctified, number one, verse three, keep away from sexual immorality. <clears throat> now remember, when I say, when, when the Bible says keep away from sexual immorality from last week's discussion, this is God's will. You know what? How, how do we simplify? Because, <clears throat> because sometimes say, well, this is God's will. We immediately say, did you fast about it? Did you, did you study the scriptures for five years? Again, we are, we are, uh, we are making the will of God as though it's, it, it is something uh, very strange and, and totally unreachable. So let's put it in, in ground zero, okay? Let's put it in human level where the rubber meets the road. When you say, this is what I will, what you are saying is, this is what I want and this is what I, want, I desire. So when you say, this is God's will, it is equivalent to saying, this is what God wants. This is what He desires. Simplify it like that. So if you look at the heart of God and say, what is His desire that we live sanctified life? How, number one, we should keep away from sexual immorality. <clears throat> I told you last week that in Christianity, expectation about this thing is <clears throat> very clear. You don't have to second guess nor wonder about what God wants, okay? Sexual fidelity is expected from both male and female. Jesus is committed to the church. There are no two churches. There's only one church, one bride. Jesus is committed to it, so we are supposed to be committed to, to, to it also. There is no double standard here. You cannot say, as in Greek society, only the male <clears throat> is supposed to flee from sexual immorality because females are expected to stay home and uh, cook and do all of these things. And they are not supposed to be going around uh, like busybodies and getting another spouse. <clears throat> the other way of saying uh, a flee from sexual immorality is this. If I keep myself honorable in this area. That means <clears throat> I am living with my spouse in an honorable way. I can look at my wife at any given time during the day, tell her I love her, and, and know at the back of my mind there's nobody else. Okay? That's honorable way. That when my lips touch hers, I know it's not touching somebody else's. That when I embrace her, I know I'm not embracing somebody else. Okay? That is making it honorable. In the same way, when I say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I have no other Lord. There is no backup plan. None. That when Jesus said, I died for you, he didn't die for somebody else. He died for you. And that's the amazing language in terms of, of sacrificial lamb. There is a sense of a sacrificial lamb wherein it is individual and there is a sense it is community. Because when the individual disobeys the word of the Lord, it affects the community. That's why there's individual sacrifice and there is a community sacrifice. All are, are in the same uh, sphere of submission to the word of the Lord. So, if I say I'm honoring my wife, that means I am keeping my relationship with her pure. If I say I'm honoring the Lord, I have no other God besides Him. No other. I don't worship my work. I don't worship my, 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 
my toys, my gadgets, I don't worship them. There's just nobody else. There's just one Lord. Now, when it talks about immorality, it is very specific because the immorality here, because you can philosophize here, what is the, what is the root word for immorality? Moral. Okay? Do you understand? Okay. So, the, the, the root word for immorality is moral. The moment you go into morals, you can go into philosophical dis discussion. So, the morality of marriage. Don't go there. You will be confusing the language, okay? That's not what, what it meant. When we are talking about immorality here, we're not talking about any philosophical idea. There is a very strong sexual overtone in this context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Read the context. There is a very strong sexual overtone. That means keep your marriage bed <coughs> pure. And we talked about it last week. Faith <coughs> is not, not actually a mirror. Our, your faith, my faith, <coughs> it is not a mirror or a reflection of our culture. Okay? Our faith should affect our culture. But my faith, your faith, our biblical faith, is not a mere reflection of our culture. What do I mean by that? If our culture says it's okay to have sex outside of marriage, that's cultural expression. It is not my faith expression. And so I oppose that. Why? Because the cult, my faith is not an expression of my culture. My faith affects my culture. That's why I have a biblical culture. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It should not move my faith. That's why you will find that in religion, their faith actually is an expression of their culture. That's why when lawmakers passed same-sex marriage and approve LGBTQ, some religion just said yes. Why? Because their faith is a reflection of their culture. Now understand this. Biblical faith is not an expression of our culture. In fact, biblical faith is contra-culture. That's why the culture laughs at us. It mocks us. In fact, our life is contra-culture. You know. Can you imagine at one point, my kids were still in elementary, if, you start, if, you, if your uh, <clears throat> uh, child cannot understand the lectures, immediately he's got <clears throat> a, how do you call it? Attention, attention deficit disorder. Suddenly, 90% of the population has Attention deficit, the ADD, attention deficit door. It became culturally, uh, it, it became a cultural escape. Everybody has ADD. And you know, in the church, there are some people <clears throat> whose faith is an expression of culture. So even in this church, there are some members whose children immediately have ADD. When... How in the world can they have ADD when they are playing in the video games? They are 100% attentive. They remember their score from last year. They know their progress. What are you talking about ADD? You can understand the rules of the games. You have no ADD. You just don't want to study. But it became a cultural escape, you know. And so a lot of us, when, when the culture dictates something, we immediately submit our children and family to it. Why? Because our faith is very shallow. In fact, it's not even real faith sometimes. Because it is just an expression of your culture. Biblical faith is contra-culture. It goes against norms. It looks at the scriptures and says, that's me, that's what the Bible says, I should live, how, how I should live, how I should behave. Doesn't matter what the culture tells me, that's how I'm going to live. Okay? Faith, therefore... <clears throat> is set apart, it is sanctified. That's what set, sets me apart, what, what I believe. That's why you look at the Muslim world, you wonder, 
why they are very willing to have themselves martyred. They call it martyred. They are attacking, but they call themselves martyred. It's because that's part of their faith. The faith of the Muslim is their culture. And so they are willing to throw themselves in the fires of death and be claimed for as long as they're going to die as martyrs because it's one of the highest honor that they have to die as a martyr. And so they throw themselves like that. Their faith is an expression of their culture. Second, so first is uh, keep away from sexual immorality. <clears throat> Again, the expression is the comparison with our relationship with God. I cannot, there is no other God before me. Very simple. If I will apply that to marriage, I can say, and there should be no other man before me. That's the expression. That's what, that makes it simple. You know, There should be no other man before me. God is saying there should be no other God before me. Okay? Second is control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. That's verses 4 to 5. Now, this is a very interesting passage. In the Revised Standard Versions, it's one of the better translations, actually. I think better than King James. <clears throat> but it translates this differently. Each one of you know how to take a wife for himself. That's how it translates it, because of the word vessel. Now, the idiom of the day and the context seems to, seems to indicate that body, the human body, control your own body, is synonymous with vessel. Now, remember, uh, the female is the weaker vessel, the weaker body. And again, no matter how, how the feminist puts it, really the female body is weaker than the male body. Uh, I don't care how strong my wife gets, she is considerably a lot weaker than me, okay? I squeeze her hand a little bit, she screams like a chicken, you know? The, the pain tolerance is, is just too low. DJ is the same. <clears throat> she may be a healthy young, young lady, but believe me, she is, she is weaker than Joel. Uh, Joel is developing some some physical strength and people will say well <clears throat> man cannot cannot uh, give birth and cannot carry the load of uh, a baby in her in his womb where there's no womb in his belly for nine that's a lie first of all you will never know number two you can compare have you seen a lot of male with big tummies that's heavier than a baby and they don't carry it for nine months, okay? They carry it for decades. <laughs> you know, they carry the thing for decades and they don't die, yeah. So you cannot really make the comparison because number one, uh, they say, well, the childbirth is the greatest pain. Well, according to you, but I have seen some very horrendous torture instruments. I can't imagine the pain and male bodies were subjected to it. And some of them did not collapse under pressure. Yeah. So really, this is just a philosophical discussion. But <clears throat> our, the, the, the physical body, control your own vessel. Okay? Now, because it's tied up to sexual conduct, you also control the vessel of your spouse. That's why the RSB decided to translate that. You need to have a wife of your own. Okay? Find your own wife. Don't... Now, the implication of this is phenomenal. I know it's, it's the culture of today that people have so many sexual partners. That is prohibited. Paul is saying, you want to have sex? Find yourself a wife. Don't jump around. That's why I'm saying, really, it's more biblical. There is no dating in the scriptures, by the way. Dating is a modern uh, phenomena. There is no more courtship. I like it when there was courtship, because there is knowledge, there's, 
getting to know each other, and no more now, just sex altogether. Well, here, we are prohibited from having sexual immorality. You want to have sex? Get married. That's what Paul meant in Corinthians when he said, it is better to get married than burn. Okay? Now, some people want a free sex. That is prohibited. I told you about Fred Price when this uh, homosexual agenda began to kick off and all of these sexual activities. He knew that his worship team, his, his uh, choir, he, he knew they will lie. You know, parents, you know when your children will lie. I know when congregation will lie. So Fred Fries knew that. So when news is spread that that is being exercised in the church, he doesn't want to be condemning to anybody. So he gathered the whole worship team, and he's got a rather large worship team, and all of his choir. I don't know how many hundreds, perhaps a couple of hundreds. He gathered them in the altar and said, this is what's going on in our culture today. You know, and he itemized the sexual sins. And he said this, he said, listen, I am not going to ask any of you if you are guilty of this. It is your, it is your responsibility to repent. He said, I'm not going to ask you. But he said, because it has come to my knowledge, I'm going to hold you under a covenant that from this hour on, you will not participate in any of this. And he made them sign. And he said this, and I'm binding all of you under a curse. If from this hour on you violate this, I am asking the Lord to put you under a curse. He said, but I will not ask you about your, your activities prior to this. I'm not going to go into that. So uh, that's what happened. You know, and I can tell you stories of what happened after that, those who, who wink at it. And then his son, who replaced him as senior pastor, they elevated him as an apostle of the church, committed adultery. Mind you, in public, Fred Price stood up and said, from now on, my son will not be preaching. He will sit in front for two years. He's not allowed to sit at the back. He will sit in front for two years. He will listen to the teaching of the Word of God. He's not allowed to have any ministry. Just remove, in front of everybody. And then he had his son to stand up and apologize, repent to the whole church. Yeah. That's what happened. Now, <clears throat> we, we are talking about the second coming of the Lord. Jesus will return to a church without spot or wrinkle. Okay. I know because of, of uh, promiscuity and acceptability of the sexual revolution, which started in the 60s and now had spilled over to our days and had become very acceptable. Paul made a comparison. The Gentiles do this because they don't know God. What Paul is saying is this. If you start behaving like this, you are equivalent to a Gentile. You are equivalent to a person who doesn't know God. I don't behave like that because I know God. There is no other woman before me because I know God. I don't sleep around because I know God. You know. So I told my, my, my kids, you date, you must be ready to get married tomorrow. Yeah. That's why I, I give permission to, to uh, Joseph and John to date because they can get married tomorrow. I don't, I don't want them uh, exploring their sexuality while, while dating because America is, is a fallen society, morally speaking. You know, I don't want DJ dating because she's still trying to study, you know. Uh, she's not allowed to. She dates, she should get married tomorrow. I don't want her uh, having sex with anybody other than her husband. You know, if I die, you know. I don't want James dating. What is, it, what is that little boy going to do? Just look at the woman? No. 
The temptation to have sex will be very high. Same thing with Joel. Yeah. They date, they better be ready to get married tomorrow. Because this is, this is a prohibition from the Lord. You say, well, that's too strict. Oh, what do you want? Loose? You want your kids to be sleeping around with, with every opposite sex they see around the corner? There's a saying in the Philippines, there are men na lagyan mo ng sayo yung poste, liligawan. You know. And really, I look, I look at some of the young men and even older men uh, in this society. There is just no class. And there is just uh, no judgment. You look at this man, what in the world are you doing dating that, I don't know if it's a girl or a boy, you know? Have you seen how, how, how people today choose their partners? They are not physically blind, but they might as well be. You know, if you, will, if you will not be culturally sensitive, you will say, who is that ape that you are dating? You know, some of these people that you date, you look around, they don't even know how to put their belts on, their, their pants are falling down, and their underwear is showing up. What kind of individual is that? You know? The, the class... There's no more dignity. There's no more. Remember, we're sanctified. Yeah. Say, I'm sanctified. I am sanctified. Now, I have to understand this. This is how I have been teaching from the beginning. I never change my teachings. So if you say, pastors, this is very strict, well, get used to it. If you can get a hold of my tapes from the beginning of this church, I never change my doctrine. Why? Because my Bible never changed. Are you listening? Amen. We are waiting for the second coming of the Lord. And so this is how we apply uh, sanctification. Now, having said that also, <clears throat> our physical body is not something that you put down. There is value in this physical body. It is, it is so valuable to God that when he created Adam, he decided he will not just speak the word. Rather, in human terms, he will get his hands dirty. How do you know your hands are dirty? It gets dirt. Okay? He took dirt from the ground and fashioned it himself. That's how valuable the human body is. It is so valuable that after the fall, it starts aging. And God says, I, don't, I didn't design it that way. And so he devised a plan that the coming of the Lord, you and I who believe, will have our bodies changed. It will be what you call as glorified body. Now, the original body is different. The original body is not glorified, but it has put on glory cloth. That's why it should not, without sin, it's not supposed to die. Now, God gave us a better, God is going to give us a better body than that of Adam. Adam's body is not glorified. It's not supposed to be glorified. It just have a glory clothing. We are not just going to have a glory clothing at the coming of the Lord. Our body is going to be glorified. And we're going to, have, we're going to put on white, uh, white clothes. I don't know if it's, if, if it's one piece or... I don't know how it's going to look like, you know. But it's a picture of holiness. But our body, our, this body itself will not put on a glory clothing. This will be glorified. This is how valuable the human body is. But, but the modern man had put, it's just flesh, they say. It's just dust. No, it's not just dust. It's fashioned after the image of God. The Gentiles are the ones <clears throat> who uh, ignore the sanctity of the human body. Now, having said that, I'm not going to say something that I don't find in the Scriptures, so some are left open. But going back to the Old Testament, that's why even putting tattoo is prohibited in the Old Testament. Yeah. Why? Because it is already good as God designed it. Now, I know now, a lot of worship leaders, now I go to some seminars and the worship leaders have tattoo in their neck 
What are they doing? They are copying the world. I, I don't understand why or even worship leaders copy the world. Yeah. So you got born again. And the Lord glorified your body. Do, do you think those tattoos will stay there? No, I mean it's glorified. What do you think? Why will, that, why will it not stay there? Simple. I'll go back to what I said earlier. God doesn't want it. If he doesn't want it then, why will he want it now? Really, this is a simple uh, deduction that you can, that you can uh, do yourself. Anything that God doesn't want, he will remove. So if he doesn't want it then, why will he want it now? But I know it's, now if, if you have a tattoo, uh, I'm not going to say bless your, your body. I'm just saying you have it. But uh, I'm telling you, in the scriptures, God doesn't want it. Yeah. Show me in the scriptures that he wants it. If I'm going to have a tattoo, perhaps I'm going to put on the face in my chest. But God doesn't want it, you know. Because most tattoos right now are actually fake. So. Uh, but God doesn't want it. Some put Superman. You really believe you are Superman? You, you can't even overcome sin. You call yourself Superman? Shame on you. You cannot even lift the dishes that your mom wants you to move from one sink to another. Uh, the only thing that you can lift is the remote control on the television and your phone that you play with. Yeah, it's not even Superman. Maybe a super aunt. Or something like that. But not a superman. But we have, we have uh, veered away from the simplest truths of the scriptures. And we have allowed culture to dictate what we are supposed to be doing. Number three. Do not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or a sister. In this manner, verse 6. In this manner, what manner? Sexual uh, impropriety. Do not take advantage. This is simple. You should not conduct yourself toward women in a way that will wrong your partner. Okay? If, well, I am married. If I find a woman that is attractive, attracted to me and I decided I'll take off my ring. By the way, I have not taken off my ring since we got married. My wife took up her ring several times. Uh, I think she has... Allergy on, right? Something like that. Allergy on, on her finger. Me, I'm not allergic to her, so uh, I never had any allergy. So I never took off this ring. Uh, if I took off my ring because I found a woman that I like, what I'm doing actually is I'm taking advantage of her. And I'm also taking advantage of my wife. I am, look, I am counting on her faith to forgive me. I can't take advantage of that. Christians are like that, they forgive. I'll take advantage of that. And so when she rebukes me, she said, well, I thought you were born again, Anne. You're supposed to forgive me. I'm taking advantage of that. It's like this. Well, I would like to think I am generous, you know. If people know I'm generous, they can take advantage of that and say, hey, Pastor, say, let's, let's, look, uh, I, I, tell, I tell the mission field, the Lord has blessed us financially that, that we have money for missions. Now, if they don't love me, they can take advantage of that and say, let's do this, let's do that. No, I'm not going to let them take it. That's illegal. And so, I know I have to forgive Will my wife take advantage of that and say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to forgive me. Well, you know that. If you do it on purpose, you're taking advantage. You see? It's prohibited here. We are not supposed, I'm not supposed to take advantage of the Christianity of my wife to my advantage. Like, I cannot, I cannot go around looking for another woman knowing that she ought to forgive me, whether she likes it or not. If she is going to live a Christian life, she has to forgive me. And so I can take advantage of that. You know. 
By the way, members of the church do that. Well, pastor also is a pastor. She's, he's supposed to be doing this. So you guys want to take advantage of me and, and, and use that against me. I'm not going to let you do that. Because, number one, I know my role. I know my Bible. And number two, it's prohibited that we take advantage of each other's faith. Are you listening? That's why when a pastor knows that she just received a, sum, a, sum, a, a good amount of bonus, and I tell her, Sister, I have a need. Can you please pray with me that God will give me $2,000? Because I heard she just got a bonus of $20,000. Well, I'm taking advantage of her. If she is gullible, she'll be taken advantage of. But that is not, that's why, look, we, I take one offering. I don't, I don't preach a sermon before the offering. Why? I'm not going to move you to tears so that you will give more. That's taking advantage of you. I, I should count on your faith that you're obedient to God. So I call on the ushers, collect tithes and offering, and that's it. Whether you obey or not, it's none of my business. It's your relationship with God. But I cannot preach um, extra sermons, tear jerkers, to move you emotionally. So even if you are not willing, you will give. That's taking advantage of you. See? Are you following me? Don't be sad. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm just teaching the scriptures, okay? So do not <clears throat> take advantage of a brother or a sister. Do not cheat on your brother. Do not cheat on your sister. Do not do something against a brother or a sister. Remember, it's a fellow Christian. You know, we... Uh, I, uh, have you guys shop at Ikea? They have good designs, but totally taking advantage of everybody. I mean, some of their wood, that are real wood, parang palocheta, you can squeeze it. It's so soft, you can squeeze it. And my goodness, the screws that they use that are made in China, you put a little bit of pressure, you chip it. What are these marketers doing? They are taking advantage of our foolishness. And they're taking advantage of the market. There is no other market there. There is no other market. You know. That's why there is a law against monopoly and all of those things, trying to prevent taking advantage. But this is the same thing. So in, in old times, for example, the Roman Catholic Church and other, other state religion, they take advantage of being a Catholic, and that's the only religion in their, in their, in their country, that they take advantage of the people. Can you imagine the Roman Catholic Church selling indulgences? If you give this much money for the repair of the Vatican, you are absolved for your, from your sins for one year. If you give more, double it, you are absolved from your sins for two years. It's available now on Netflix, I think, or YouTube, the old movie on Martin Luther. Watch that. Martin Luther, being a Catholic priest, saw one of his parishioners drunk. That's when they were raising money to repair the Vatican. It's black and white. And he said, brother, you're drunk, because he's been rebuking that brother for a while. And the guy held a piece of paper saying, yeah, but I have been forgiven for one year. He's got a piece of paper saying that he can get drunk for one year and it will not be taken against him. That's taking advantage of a brother or a sister. If I manipulate your emotions so you will give towards a project, that's taking advantage of you. You see? That's why you have, you've got to cut it simple. Obedient faith. Do not also use, do not also violate the sensibilities of other, of other human beings. This practice, if you take advantage, suggests from the language of Paul, that you're be making yourself less than human. Because in other uh, writing, he says, worse than infidel. Okay? Number four. Let's talk about reasons for the call to sanctify self. Number one, because God will avenge these things. Now, again, the context is on sexual immorality. If, okay, if, Somebody uh, take a liking of my, to, to my wife. And there were some. My, my kids, 
happened to be with her when, when some men are trying to, how do you call it, hit on my wife. I know why they call it hit on my wife. They're, like, she's, they're gonna hit her. And there were, there were times John was very upset with the Popeye chicken sales person, right John? <laughs> Even now you're still angry, right? Uh, I think I think Joseph was with with my wife somewhere, and a man was was trying to flirt on my wife. And Joseph says that old lady is my is my mother, you know, uh, meaning they are zealous uh, for what is right, but they are also trying to protect my interest. Now. Say somebody uh, ignored all of that and tried to go for my wife. You know what the Bible says? God will avenge me. Yeah. That's the context of the avenger. Why? Because the comparison is between Jesus and the church. If you hurt the church, God don't the uniform of the avenger. Now remember this. Satan has been trying to steal, kill, and destroy the community of faith. Guess how God will avenge it? He'll be thrown in hell. Yeah? Along with his followers. So anybody who offends the church, listen to this, anybody who tries to destroy the church, look, anybody who spread bad rumors against any church, just with the with evil intent of destroying it, God says, I'm the avenger. That's the ultimate message there. He will not stay silent. There is a time of reckoning for these things. And so if somebody tries to, to go for my wife, oh, that's knowing that I'm a pastor and I'll forgive. You know, my, I told you my brother who died, a pastor, uh, his wife was, uh, was, uh, was having sex with, his, with, her, with her pastor. And his kids that was DNA tested were not his. And, and I, was, I was very furious. Thank God I did, not, I, I did not see the guy. Because remember, I will only see, her in the, see him in the Philippines. I'm, I'm telling you, I had all my plans on what I'm going to do with the guy. But my brother told me this, Kuya, did I sin against God? I said, why? This, when he was about to die. I said, why? What happened? He said, because I saw the pastor in the laundromat, and my anger rose within me, and I hit him. Did I sin? I said, no. And I said, but you were wrong. Said, what do you mean? I said, because you should not just have hit him. I said, you should have hit him several times, floored him until he forgot his name. I said, but don't kill him, you know, because then you'll go to jail. Uh, and he said, so I did not say, I said, no, you did not sin. I said, without, without thinking much, I said, no, you did not sin. Yeah. But here, uh, God is the avenger. Everything that, that is happening in America right now, the changing of partners and all of these things. God doesn't look at it kindly. The American law may approve it, but God is listening to the cry of every wife and every husband that has been taken advantage of. And this is the message from the Lord. I am the avenger. I will avenge you. Are you listening? Now, rejection of this message is equal to rejecting God. Why? Because he's the one who gives the Holy Spirit. Remember, the church is not a democracy. I know why, why people keep saying, let's vote on this. No, the church is never, will never be a democracy. It is a theocracy. Okay? When you, when you force democracy in a church... I mean, it's run by a committee. That's what ruins it, okay? 
Because God will never speak to a committee. He speaks to his man. Okay? It's just like in a the, in the family. God had blessed me to be the head of my house because I'm the man. And God basically leads me on how I should, I should uh, conduct the affairs. Can you imagine if I, if I deliberated on everything with my wife? Minor things I deliberate with my wife. But things that will determine the direction of our family, no deliberation. Yeah. The, the, the little things, what is the color of the paint in the house? Who in the world cares about that? Before I was delivering it to my wife, now I don't even care. Let her make a decision. What furniture will we buy? That's puny. That's, that's nothing to me. Okay? It annoys me when she buys things I don't like, but that's really uh, very elementary. But major things. You know. If my wife plan on bringing my kids to a gathering where an extended family is involved with homosexual marriage, I told my wife, don't you dare. And I told my kids, you can disobey your mother. They drag you to a party where same-sex marriage is present, where adulterers is glorified. I said, say no to your mother. I don't care if she, 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 she screams at you. You disobey her. That's my law. That's in the scriptures. Minor things, she can decide. You know, what telephone provider, she, she can do that. But in terms of eternity, I lead. In terms of what matters for eternity, I lead. Okay? And I told my kids this also, and my wife, if you see me doing something that is opposite of faith, then you can disregard my authority. You can disobey me also. That's the parameters. Why? Because there is heaven and there is hell. And it matters where we spend our eternity. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, the church is a theocracy. That's why we seek God's face. If it's not a theocracy, why in the world did we say, Lord, show us your will? And after we say, show us your will, we vote on something. It's, it's just contradictory, you know? But uh, that's why we seek God's face, show us your will. And he will make his will clearer to us. Our behavior or conduct is not going to be determined by majority vote. Like, for example, there is not going to be any vote in this church whether we will approve same-sex marriage or not. There will not be any vote. Putting that in the Constitution and bylaws, uh, we voted on it because it's a legal thing. But my wife will tell you this. Years ago when we voted on it, if the church voted to approve homosexual lifestyle, before the service that night, I told my wife, if by any chance there is a devil's influence in the church, and I, it is rejected, that we will not put in the conscience. My wife knows this, only the two of us knows this. My kids doesn't know that. If that was not approved, that put in the conscience, I will resign that night. I told my wife I cannot pastor a church like that. So I told my wife, we're going to put it in the Constitution. But I, I said, Anne, are you ready for this? She said, what do you mean? I said, because if it's not approved, I am out by tonight. I'll tell, because it's not subject to deliberation. Yeah. Not subject to deliberation. There are just some, some things that are very clear in the Scriptures that we cannot violate. Your vote doesn't count. My opinion doesn't count. It's only the word of the Lord that counts. You know? That's so why my wife struggles sometimes. How come my kids, she will say, I tell them to do this, they will not listen. I told my wife, it's your doing. I said, do you ever see me beg my kids? No, I tell them, throw the trash, throw it now. You mean now, Papa, why? You mean, you mean tomorrow? There are certain things that are not negotiable as far as authority is concerned. I said, you want to deliberate? Enjoy yourself. I just don't deliberate. You know? Now, that may sound strange because we are living in a fallen society. 
God is the only one who knows how we should live. That's why he redeemed us from our old lifestyle. It stinks. It leads us to hell. That's a foul lifestyle. That's why Jesus was sent to redeem us. Now remember this. We were redeemed from that lifestyle. Why are we trying to go back to it? He is the only one, God is the only one, who determines the nature of holiness. He defines holiness. He implements holiness. He exemplifies holiness. No other human being can teach us holiness. I cannot even teach you that. I can only relate to you what God says. Because if I will be the standard of holiness, we will not go to heaven. If we will use our culture as the standard of holiness, it will just fail. Holiness is determined, mandated by God. And in, if, if in faith we make a decision, my life is sanctified. Then he provides the strength. He provides the testings. He provides everything that will help us to live godly lives. Amen? Amen. Remember, Jesus is coming back again. Amen. Sooner than you think. And I think we should always pray like John in the book of Revelation. Even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? I'm ready. If Jesus wants to return right now, I am on 100%. Not, there is absolutely nothing. I'm not going to say, wait for, for one week, Lord, I'm going to sell all my tools. Forget those tools. You know, forget them. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing on earth that's going to hold me down. He tells me time to go home. I'm ready. I'm ready. You know. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand.